Hello, everyone. Welcome to our newest installment of the free programming that we're providing for you to engage with students, especially this week, building relationships across political difference. Uh, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you for spending some time today joining us. I think this is a really important conversation and I'm, I'm very excited to continue to build this virtual community with you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Glenn Manning. I'm the Senior Project Manager for Caring Schools at Making Caring Common, project at Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'm incredibly glad to be joined today uh, by Rick Weisborg, Faculty Director at MCC and a Senior Lecturer at Harvard Graduate School of Education and Kennedy School of Government. Rick will walk us through the case study today. Um, and I'll, of course, be available to answer your questions in the chat and offline. We invite you, as always, to visit our webpage, uh, sign up for our newsletter, and follow us on social media. I'll go ahead and post to the chat uh, a link so that you can do that. So go ahead and check that out. And then also, I'll, I'll post uh, a link to our main page as well, so you can take a look at Making Care in Commons work in general. We have um, a wide variety of reports, resources for educators and families, as well as research and initiatives that um, could be really helpful to you. So I hope that you will have a, a chance to explore the webpage. A little bit about Making Care in Common before we jump in too deeply. Uh, we are a project of Harvard Graduate School of Education, like I said, and our mission is to help raise kids who care about others and the common good. We really envision a world in which uh, young people learn how to treat each other well day to day um, and understand justice and fairness and, um, you know, at times do what is right even if it goes at the cost of themselves. So um, I think that this conversation will go a long way toward those goals today and, and hopefully will be very, very helpful to you as well. Quickly, I just wanted to cover a little bit about um, what we're going to, to walk through today. Uh, Rick, if you wouldn't mind advancing that slide to the, the next page. Um, I'm gonna cover a case study from one school to open up the conversation about the values that we're balancing and prioritizing in, discussing, in discussions with, with students as they engage with their peers across political difference. You'll have a chance to talk with each other in breakout rooms about how you'd approach a scenario, this scenario, with a few different perspectives. And we'll also talk about some overall takeaways before hearing your questions. And um, then, you know, again, feel free to get after this time together if I can be helpful. Um, I hope that you reach out. Again, Glenn Manning um, is my name, and you can reach me at Caring Schools with an S at makingcaringcommon.org. I think we can jump to the next slide here. And before we even get going, I would love to hear from you a little bit about your experience um, with this kind of work and, and how ready you feel to engage with it. So I've gone ahead and opened up a poll for you that I hope that you'll take. Um, the question for those who are listening and, and are not looking at your screen is, how comfortable do you feel fostering conversations across political difference with students in your school? Response options are not at all comfortable, a little comfortable, mostly comfortable, very comfortable. We've already got about 45% of you answering this question. So thank you to those of you who have already taken the time to do so. A little bit of a horse race here, it looks like between a little comfortable and mostly comfortable. Um, we've got almost full participation, so I'll leave this open for perhaps another 10 seconds or so for those of you who are doing some hard thinking about this. Yeah. Um, and we've got about 85%, so close that poll. So we can all take a look. And it looks like many folks on this call today feel mostly comfortable, which is uh, if you find yourself in that not at all comfortable or a little comfortable category, that's totally fine. Um, we all come to this work with different levels of readiness. So um, just wanted to share that with you and, and um, helps, I think, all of us understand kind of where, where we are generally. Um, we'll ask this question again at the end if there's some time. 
Today, our goal is really to, to talk through some of the challenges of building caring school community amidst political differences and really during this time. So we'll use a case study and ask you to think about how you might handle various different types of situations and talk about the issues facing each of the students involved. If you have questions as you consider how you might do this work in your school, again, I hope that you'll get in touch with us um, or check out perhaps even the Caring Schools Network which is a, a more robust collaboration with Making Care in Common. We really help schools through a process of continuous improvement by gathering and analyzing good data and providing consultation around action planning and integrating targeted strategies to reduce problem behaviors like bullying and harassment and promote social, emotional, and ethical capacities in young folks like caring and uh, commitment to justice. So again, hope that you will uh, make sure to check us out I will drop a quick link to the Caring Schools Network into the chat now. Um, but of course, please feel free to uh, get in touch in any way that makes the most sense for you. Okay, so we can just move along here for the next slide. And in terms of, of norms, um, I'm gonna talk more about this. Um, we include in the chat MCC's suggested list of norms. So we'll go ahead and do that. And as we're sort of talking about this, I want you to be thinking that whether tackling kind of a sensitive topic or engaging with maybe less charged material to begin with, establishing a set of norms to guide student discussion is a great way to open up a learning opportunity by having students participate in norm setting. You provide them time and space to think critically about the goals of good discourse and how to balance competing ideas and feelings in respectful and effective ways. Um, so Rick, would you like to sort of pick it up here and, and share more about the importance of this crucial step? As you do, I'll, I'll go ahead and paste our suggested norms to the chat. Uh, yeah, Glenn, you know, I can't see the I, I can't see the chat box, so if, if we get questions, you're gonna you're gonna have to help me out. But first, hi everybody, it's it's great to see you, and I'm really looking forward to this to this conversation. Um, and I'm delighted that you're interested in this in this difficult conversation. Um, I, what I'd like to suggest is just taking a minute for you just to go through the norms, to take um, to take a look at the norms and. Uh, if you have concerns or questions to raise them. I also just want to clarify um, what we mean by a couple of the norms too, but why don't you first just take a minute to review, to review them. So Glenn, maybe I should just explain at least one of the norms. Sure thing. So the norm about um, being mindful of what burdens you're asking people to bear and who you're asking to bear them the, the reason this one, you know, we're underscoring this one is because, you know, there are lots of political conversations where values come in conflicts. Um, so if you are a religious student and you think that homosexuality is a sin and you want to express that view um, it is a violation of LGBTQIA students in your class. Um, so this is a situation where the right to free speech and the right to freedom from discrimination or degradation come in conflict. And I think these, uh, these kinds of conflicts are inherent in, in some, not all of our conversations about political difference. And it's just very important to think through them. And we're gonna talk more about this later and the case study will engage you more in thinking about this. But the point is that if you're gonna launch into a con conversation about gay marriage, it's really important to, we're making the case, it's important to ask yourself, what burdens am I asking LGBTQIA students in my class to bear? Um, who am I asking to bear those burdens? Similarly, when you enter conversations about race, are you asking students of color to bear an inordinate burden in those conversations? So we are encouraging a mindfulness about that. I think that these norms um, work at almost every level, but I don't, you know, some of you are teaching at very different levels. I think they need to be translated um, for, you know, in different ways. They need to be translated for students at different levels. 
but we're using them today for our discussion, but we're also using them because we think they're important guideposts for any discussion about political difference. Um, but let me stop there. If anyone, we do want to get into the case study pretty soon, but if anybody has questions or concerns about the norms, um, this would be a great time to raise them. And you can either raise your hand uh, or put them in the chat box and Glenn can read them. So Rick, it sounds like we have um, Valerie saying that she loves number seven, consider the diversity of the people in the room and imagine how others in the room might experience your comments. Um, she also says, but maybe even considering who's not in the room, which I think is a- Great point, absolutely. Yep. Um, do you have a couple of folks who are saying that they're having some trouble accessing the norms? Please do feel free to message me. I'm happy to help you walk through that. Um, looks to me like we've got Dan saying, I have no questions. List is helpful. It'd be a good reference. And it's right. for some of you, um, if you're working in Chrome, especially, that the doc should open more easily. Emily says, read critiques of the norms, um, assume good intentions as it can impede the ability to look at the impact of what is said rather than the intent. Is it possible for you to speak to that concern, Rick? Um, I think this is a great point, but I think one of our no norms is about owning impact and it's intended to respond to exactly that concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you both need to assume good intentions and own, own the impact if you say something that um, does harm to someone else. And you may need to find a way to repair that harm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Carrie says, um, if a group's going to be together long term for discussions like this, it's valuable to create the norms together, a long but worthwhile exercise that helps with commitment to them. So, um, Glenn, why don't I answer just one more? I'm just worried about time that we should move. This is another great thought um, question. You know, I think there's certain norms here that I wouldn't, um, that I would, I would treat as non-negotiable. You know, it is an, it is an okay to say something that is racist or sexist or homophobic. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about that. It, it's not okay to not be mindful of the people in the room. Um, I think it is okay to make mistakes that you can't have a conversation where you don't have mistakes. So I think some of these are non-negotiable, but I would also say that students are gonna have, um, it's a great exercise for students to be able to, to co-construct norms like these. I would just make sure that certain of these guideposts are in place because I think they're essential to a, a meaningful and ethical conversation. Absolutely. All right, why don't I go ahead, is that okay? All right, um, so I think you all know, you know, one of the reasons we are focused on this now, we live in a deeply divided uh, time, a deeply politically divided time. I think the things that unite, uh, unite us across political parties can, theme, can seem fragile and thin these days, and the things that divide us can, can seem very thick. And, um, and in our own data, we find that, uh, we've been doing surveys around political difference. We find that Significant majorities of Americans are, are in fact not living in bubbles. They are having conversations with people who don't share their political views. If you are a Biden supporter, it's likely you've had a conversation with a Trump supporter who's a member of your family or a friend or a member of your community. And, and, and similarly, at the local level, you see these conversations across political difference. The bad news is that we also gather from our surveys that a large majority of times those conversations aren't going well. People feel like they're not constructive, marginally constructive. Both sides have parallel views of each other too. Both sides see the other as making up facts, as opinionated, as rigid, as inflexible. Um, so there are these mirror images of each other too. The good news is that when we ask people do you want to have these conversations if you will feel like other people will listen to you respectfully? A large majority of people say yes. So if the conditions are right, people want to have these conversations, it looks like, um, which is a sign of hope. I will say that we did this survey right before the election. We're going to do another one after the election, and we'll see whether or not things change or not. 
Um, but we do think that it's crucial to begin to have these conversations. And we also think that there's a number of challenges in this work. And let me just add that if we don't have these conversations in schools, I don't know where else we're gonna have them in terms of preparing young people. And that's why, even though I think of this work as really stubborn and muddy and difficult, I think it's so important to do. Um, here, here are what I think are, are the main challenges in, the, in this work, and there are others. Um, one is the common failure to present convincing arguments for opposing political views. My kids went to the Cambridge Public Schools. Some of you may know Cambridge is a very liberal community. I don't think the whole time they were in the Cambridge Public Schools, they heard, they heard a solid or con convincing case for a conservative point of view. There are many Republican communities, politically homogeneous Republican communities, where nobody hears a solid case for a progressive or democratic point of view. I think it is very important to help our young people to prepare them to engage constructively with views that are different than their own and that are opposed their own. And let me be clear, I don't mean that means agreeing with those positions. You may fiercely disagree with those positions. But the point is to be able to engage those positions constructively. I also think that another real danger in this work is the sort of moral relativism that has sunk into our culture and to sunk in um, to, our, to many of our schools. I hear this all the time. I hear it among my students at the graduate school level that everyone has a right to their opinion, that there aren't any moral principles that are universal. And I want you to consider it for a minute how dangerous that is, because you know if you don't believe there are moral principles that are universal, you don't have a basis for distinguishing between marching to protect human rights in Charlottesville and marching to degrade human rights in Charlottesville. And this was a critical distinction that large numbers of Americans couldn't make. So I am making the case to you that these conversations do have to be guided by basic principles of justice and human rights. You can have many positions about immigration. You can think we should have stricter border enforcement. You, you should think we should let more people, we should have more flexible borders. Um, but you can't separate parents and children at the border. That is a violation of human rights. And these kind of principles need to guide these conversations. You can be pro-life or pro-choice. Both of those positions are rooted in moral principles. But these distinctions are critical to make. When is a political position rooted in a moral principle and when is it not rooted in a moral principle? Let me just say two other things. One is that many of our schools are politically homogeneous and that means that I think if we're gonna have these conversations, we have to be able to create opportunities for people in our schools, either in person or virtually, to interact with other schools and other communities where people have very different, very different views. And I think there are wonderful and really constructive ways to do that. And the final thing, which I forgot to list here, is that people need training and support in leading these conversations. I don't think these conversations are for everybody to lead. I think these are complex conversations with many different challenges. And we should at least think about how to give a few people in the school building the training and support they need to do this well. Okay, I wanna launch us into this scenario. And I think this will immerse us in some of the complexities of this. And I'm just gonna ask you to take a, a couple of minutes to read the scenario. And then I will share with you a couple of questions that I'm gonna ask you to think about. And then we'll go into breakout groups so you'll have a chance to dig in a little more. And we'll have plenty of time for your questions and thoughts. Marshall High School is in a town outside a major urban area in the United States. It has about 800 students. About 25% of its students are Latino or Latino, 20% of its students are Black, 5% are Asian, and 50% are white. Most of its students consider themselves Democrats or liberals, but about 20% of its students are conservative. About two weeks after the murder of George Floyd, a student, Matt, starts attending school each day with a MAGA hat. Over the next few days, he's regularly and loudly insulted by numerous other students of various races and ethnicities. A few of these students regularly give him the finger in the halls and class. Matt posts on social media that the students and the adults in the school are, quote, total hypocrites. They claim to believe in free speech and respect diverse opinions, but no student or adult in the school has defended him. Not once, he writes, 
as a teacher intervened when he was being insulted in the hall, even though teachers were well within earshot. The post is read widely by students and staff at the school. About 20 predominantly white students defend Matt on social media. Their basic message is that everyone has a right to express their opinions. And they point out that many students wear Black Lives Matter t-shirts. But most students express outrage about Matt wearing the hat, arguing that it's very offensive to other students, that he's a racist, and that he's supporting a president who's a racist and a bigot. Thank you, Glenn. Sure Let me just share with you the two questions I'm going to ask you to consider. Um, there are many ways and many levels that a school might respond to this situation. I am going to encourage you in your breakout group to discuss um, a few different types of responses that you think might be helpful. Um, the second question that I'm going to encourage you to take up is imagine you are a teacher at the school and Matt comes to talk to you and he is complaining trouble about the way he's been treated. How might you engage Matt in this conversation? What do you think is important for Matt to consider? What are the words that you might actually use with Matt in a situation like this? And maybe if we have time, we can even do a quick role play about this. I'd love to do a role play with one of you about this. So um, why don't we do uh, a breakout group um, for about 10 minutes or so? Does that work, Glenn? And, uh, and we will reconvene. Is, I think just about everybody's back. Um, so I, we would love to hear your thoughts about this, both the general question about how might you respond to this situation, kinds of things you spoke about in your breakout groups, but also the question about how might you respond to Matt specifically, if Matt was to, to come to you troubled by um, the harassment he's been suffering. And if anyone would like to kick us off, that would be great. You can either raise your hand, which I would prefer, so we can have a conversation or use the chat, which is totally fine too, either way. Go ahead. All I, all I see is young med mediation. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Kathy Young. Hi there. Hi, um, Kathy. Nice to meet you. Yeah, very nice to meet you. Um, so we talked about um, restorative circles and chats. Um, and someone in the group talked about how when it gets to this level, having them be really small um, so that people can share ideas. So initially, um, we talked about having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Matt um, finding out what that the hat means to him as well as uh, why it's important for him to wear it and then to try to see if, if he can understand what it might reflect to other people and then to actually join in on some conversations um, with his peers so that there can be authentic communication and understanding. Um, one thing that I feel strongly about is that the, the administration takes a pretty strong stand on what's allowed and what's not allowed or in supporting this kind of restorative dialogue so that it doesn't just come from that one classroom, that it comes from the, the school culture. Yeah, well, very beautifully put and very helpful. Other people have thoughts about this? I'm just wondering what the administration in a public school anyhow um, should permit and what it should um, prohibit. And the specifics that came up in our small chat group was, uh, or included, um, what could be printed on masks, what could be put on vehicles in the parking lot, what could be messages could be placed on shirts or hats, whether hats should be permitted. All of those seem to me to be administrative policy questions that have to get resolved. Maybe the students can be brought in to the discussion of them. Was there a feeling in your group that maybe Matt should not be allowed to wear a MAGA hat? In one of our members pointed out that in the school she, where she works, there, no hats are permitted. So the MAGA hat became moot but not the MAGA, well, not uh, political messages on, on ma face masks that are required. So, but th that sort of begs the question, if hats are prohibited, um, it still leaves open the question, what political messages can be expressed 
in what media on school grounds? Oh, great. It's a great question. Other people have thoughts from their groups. Hi. Um, I just raised, uh, just sort of related to David's point, um, you know, Tinker versus Des Moines. I, I met Mary Beth Tinker uh, years ago. Um, she was, she and her brother got in trouble with the administration for their protest of the Vietnam War and the Supreme Court famously ruled that students' rights to free speech do not end at the schoolhouse door. Now it does have to not interfere with education. And I suppose one might say that this does, and certainly a blanket prohibition on hats might, might cover it, but it doesn't say whether you've got a pin or a t-shirt or a bumper sticker or those sorts of things that are political speech. Um, and so that obviously, if you're in a public school, um, makes the, the question a little bit more uh, complicated. Um, and I think it's important that students have their free rights protected because, uh, and, you know, in this example, some people who might support a student protesting against the Vietnam War, um, who might be opposed to a MAGA message, but that's the whole beauty of the First Amendment, right? We don't get to choose which messages are protected, um, but we protect the right itself. So that's where I think it gets really tricky and in, in trying to help students understand you've got this right, but what, what does that message um, that you're sending and wearing on your hat connote to others uh, is, uh, I think, a, a valuable conversation to try to have, get the students to grapple with. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is it Gazelle? Gazelle, yes, thank you. So thank I you. just wanted to um, thank uh, Peter and the people before, um, including Kathy, for their comments. I think that it's important that as administrators and teachers, we don't find ways to avoid the difficult conversations because there's great value in having these conversations. And if we create policies to try to avoid in some ways, um, the, issues, the issues would just simmer underneath and then it, they can be triggered and you, we won't have a good idea of where it came from or what happened. So I, I feel that it's best to take on the issues and, and address them and help students work through all of that, you know, especially in our educational settings. Mm -hmm. Great. Other thoughts or comments or questions? Well, um, Emily. Yes, and also um, nice to see you. Um, many decades ago, we were both at the Ed School. I had a different last name then, so I'm sure you don't remember, but it's nice to see you again. Nice um, to see you. Uh, we talked in our group a bit about just the sort of setup of the scenario that it seemed like you had gone very far down a, a negative path. I mean, if what the student is reporting is that, you know, other kids were giving him the finger and teachers heard within in, within earshot of, or vision, I guess, of teachers and nothing was done, that it really, I guess we were wondering like, maybe the social media post wouldn't have happened if there had been intervention earlier talking to students about what the expected behaviors are, what the expe expectations are around kindness and not bullying students and norms and all of that, that it seemed like it had really escalated pretty intensely up yeah. to this point. Um, is it Eileen? Yes, it's Aileen. Thank you. Aileen, sorry. Um, well, I was thinking that it was an interesting time for Matt to have chosen to start wearing his hat. There's a difference between a student who might have been wearing, you know, a hat like this or a shirt or a button for a long period of time. And then suddenly choosing this time, you know, highly emotional two weeks after George Floyd's death to come to school or raise the issue. And, and I also think what's missing from the scenario, and I wonder is what has the school done in response to an event, a national event like the death of George Floyd? Yeah, has the point. school done something to address it? Because this is a highly emotional and political and an issue that I think, especially in public schools, we have a responsibility to make a statement about because it is harmful to all of our students <laughs> to witness something like this in the media and to have it just occur at, in our country. So what has the school done? Because I think the school 
if they haven't done anything to engage the conversation or make a statement is leaving the door open for these kinds of things to happen amongst students. And I think that there has to be something structural um, already, so. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate the point. I think that's totally right. Um, any of you up for doing a quick role play with me about this on the, around the words? I, I will be Matt around the actual words you would use in this situation. Just before we, we jump into that, Rick, there, there was one question from the chat. Um, yeah. If the finger is bullying, Valerie asks, if the finger's bullying, is the MAGA hat bullying? And she says, punching up versus punching down. Uh, so I think, I'm sorry, the, the woman from the Young Mediation Association, I forgot your name already, sorry. Hi, I'm Kathy. Kathy. Yes. So uh, let me, it's a great question, and let me suggest this to you, which is, um, and I'd be, you know, in interested in your thoughts. I think that Kathy asked the key question, which is, what is the meaning to the hat to Matt, for Matt? Is Matt wearing the hat because he's pro-life and his family is pro-life? Um, is he wearing the hat because um, his parents have told him that uh, Trump is much better for the economy and that government is too big? Or is he wearing the hat as a way to support some of the, the, the bigotry and racism and sexism that, um, that Trump has uh, stood for and, and reinforced and amplified? Um, and you know, I think that question is key. Um, even if he is, as you said, Kathy, I think very astutely, even if the purpose of the hat is to tout pro-life, um, he needs to understand what his impact is. This is what owning impact is about. Mm -hmm. um, he, he needs to understand what the consequences are of that action. So I think, I think this, is, this is the issue. I, all, you know, I think you know, it's not okay to give people the finger and it's not okay to bully either. <laughs> but I think the meaning for Matt is, is very important in this situation and how it's um, and how that is handled. Uh, Thomas. You're on mute, Thomas, sorry. Um, I, I would concur with that. And I wonder if uh, given kind of a notion of starting from an ego, from egocentrism, building out the social centrism, uh, Matt might, be, an approach might first be put an emphasis on hearing Matt and having Matt experience the power and the appreciation of, of being heard and then kind of a role reversal, role taking kind of uh, out of that might come, be, develop a commitment to, to hearing. And, and in that sense, we might, try to expand people's conceptions of integrity to include not just advocacy, me speaking my view to others, but rather deep listening, me hearing others. And that's a central part of who I am and what it means to be a- Yeah, a, no, that's a great point. Citizen. Yeah, yeah. And, and, to, and to Aileen's point, you know, I think that this is, uh, a different conversation if the school has done the work around the event already than if the school hasn't done the work around the event. And if Matt, if the school has done the work around the event and engaged people in really thinking deeply about this murder, the meaning of Matt wearing the hat is very different than if the school hasn't done that work. Rick, Kerry says, uh, I agree with Giselle, we've seen in recent cases of limiting speech on college campuses that when marginalized students speak up about harm, the harm can be dismissed in defense of free speech or the harm can be centered without discussing why it's important to center it. We need to discuss the intergenerational harm and trauma that has been ignored throughout our history. And Peter writes, Riverdale School in New York developed a statement on campus expression after attending a summit hosted by the University of Chicago. It's a very well written, great model for people to review as a potential. Just wanted to highlight those comments. Right. Um, I, I agree with, with Giselle too. I mean, I don't, 
Um, you know, part of the reason for these norms and is that there is forms of free speech. We have a right to free speech. We also have a right to freedom from, from degradation and discrimination. And when free speech leads to degradation or, de or discrimination, it shouldn't be condoned. Um, and how one, uh, how one handles that in a classroom is a complicated issue because I think you don't want to shame kids in a way that will make them go underground. You want them to feel like uh, they made a mistake and they're learning and tone their impact. Yeah. I tr think that's true on college campuses too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any thoughts? I think uh, Thomas may have alluded to this, but what would you say to the kids, the students who were harassing in this situation? So if you were a teacher or a counselor and they, and they came to you disturbed about the hat, what might you say to them? David? I'm oh, sorry. I didn't mean to pick on you. You're, you're, you're just lit up for a minute there. I didn't know if you wanted to. I'd be happy to respond, but I, I didn't. Go ahead. Um, I'm thinking maybe to begin addressing the particular instance that we have here in the hypothetical, going back or pivoting off of what Peter said earlier, using something like the Tinker case and the idea that the constitution doesn't stop at the schoolhouse door, that there is such a thing as a heckler's veto. Um, what do we mean by free expression in school? What should we permit? I'm also wondering, Richard, about your suggestion that the motive behind the message should determine whether or not it's permitted. Not solely. I mean, the, the consequences matter too, but I think the motive matters as well. What are your thoughts? I, I was just thinking that to begin the conversation, to depersonalize it, to take some of the heat away, um, to talk about it somewhat more abstractly using like the Supreme Court case of Tinker or some other analogy where students can look at it um, without taking themselves out of the conflict. And after they've had some time to do that, put themselves into the real issue that has surfaced in their own school. No, I think that's right. And it's related to um, some of the tips, sort of the final tips that we want to share with you. And I realize this, it's four o'clock. So maybe we should move to those tips because I'd, I'd love to give you a chance to respond to them too. So why don't we, that makes, that's okay, Dave. Why don't we go ahead and do that? And I appreciate your comment. Um, so. Rick, just while you're pulling up the, the slide there, um, Valerie mentioned, uh, you know, if Matt didn't have much, uh, much of a deeper meaning in wearing the hat. He's just maybe just being an adolescent boy. Um, you know, kind of what to do with that. Uh, and also mentioned that um, BIPOC are always sort of getting the finger wag that they need to consider the intent of the perpetrator. So there's a couple of questions in the, in the chat that were germane to that last, that last uh, bit of commentary. Um, you know, Glenn, I just think in the interest of time, I should probably move forward, but these are great questions and I'm happy to continue with anybody who wants to continue them. Uh, sorry, these were just these are just these are just things to consider. We, we began this conversation. Imagine you're the school counselor. The principal has told the students who, who have been insulting that to come to your office. How might you engage them? What do you think is important for them to consider? Imagine you're a teacher and several students have been talking about free speech. Come to talk to you after class. Does they want your opinion? How might you engage these students? What what do you think is important for them to consider? These are just questions I'm, we're encouraging you to, to reflect on. Um, here are some tips uh, that we are suggesting for you. And you know, a couple of these, few of these you have, you have already mentioned, um, but one is to be guided by a moral framework in this discussion. And I think it is the work, not just of posting values on a wall, like caring and respect and justice, 
but engaging students about thinking about how do those values live and breathe in our school building and what does it mean to um, to live those values day to day in our classrooms and the bus and our sports field. Um, I'm not tr I'm not trying to load on too much on you, but I, I do think conversations earlier in the early in the year about what the moral framework is, why it exists, why these values, and some thinking with students about how they want um, to live and breathe those values can make a world of difference. I, do, I, I didn't list it here, but I think Aileen's point is super important that um, it's also really important to engage major events in the outside world that kids are, are, are talking about and are clearly related to the moral framework that you have created in the school. Um, the setting of classroom norms and not the setting of classroom norms just the first week of class, but having norms that are touchstones throughout class that you come back to periodically. I think when you start these political conversations, it's really important to wade into yourself and to think about what your views are about a particular political issue, about whether you wanna share that view with your students, what it will mean to share that view with your students, about biases that you may have, about the degree to which you are in fact open or not open to opposing points of view. And uh, those things should really be, should guide both whether you wanna have these conversations and what kind of conversations you wanna have, what topics you wanna to take up. With some of these issues, you know, we have a huge information problem in this country. We have, you know, Barack Obama has been talking a lot about this. We have these information bubbles. We have these two alternate realities. And for a lot of these political discussions, everybody has to do some co-investigating to find out what the facts are too. Um, and there needs to be, for some of these issues, a uh, shared reality or shared understanding of the facts. Um, very concretely, I would also just recommend that you begin with less controversial topics, that you start with something like vegetarianism, or you start with legalizing marijuana, which is a much easier conversation to have than a conversation about immigrants when you have undocumented students in your class, or a conversation about gay marriage when you have gay students in your class, or LGBT, LGBTQIA students about in your class. Um, that students need to develop some comfort and some muscles in having these conversations. And even before that, and Making Care in Common has lots of resources, other people have resources um, that might be helpful as well, um, are exercises that just help students. And one of you said this with listening, with empathy, with the cognitive aspects of empathy, understanding other perspectives, but also with the affective aspects of empathy, which experiencing other feelings, other person's feelings, and the ethical aspects of empathy, which is really valuing others. Con men, torturers, salespeople, politicians can be very good at taking other perspectives, but they don't value other people. So the ethical aspect of empathy, learning how to value someone else, and especially those who are different from you, is at the heart of the matter. Or we think it's at the heart of the matter. I think you need to prepare for discomfort. And the final tip I would suggest for you is that you consider, and, I, and again, I forgot to write this down, but it, it, I started thinking about it in our discussion. You, just get, you, you should just consider whether some discussions are opt out or opt in. And the reason I say that is that um, a gay student may or may not want to have a conversation about whether religious students think homosexuality is a sin. Um, an African-American student might not want to have another conversation about the murder of George Floyd. And so I think in many of these circumstances, these conversations need to be optional. And it's important to survey students or poll students about whether or not they want to have these conversations. On um, the other conversations, I think they're just very important to have for everybody. But I would be sensitive again to the question of what burdens you're asking to, students to bear and who you're asking to bear them. Um, Glenn, you want to take it from here? Sure thing. Um, 
So folks, it would be so great to hear a little bit from you. Let's take 30 seconds to reflect on and maybe share in the chat if you're willing to do that one or two key takeaways from today's session before we jump into maybe a little bit more of a formal Q&A um, at the very end and then you know, before we wrap up. So if you'd like to take maybe just you know, 20 to 30 seconds, go ahead and let us know your key takeaways. And, I'll, and I will read those out loud as, as we start to see them roll in. Um, just as we are waiting, uh, folks have already posted saying, there should be scenarios and case studies like this at the beginning of the school year with teachers and admin conducting tabletop exercises on a war games like response so that these folks are able to get comfortable talking about this and they can be proactive um, in preventing, I assume preventing harm. Um, I think it's a great, uh, it's, a, it's a great observation, a great um, suggestion that was Valerie mentioned that. Um, Bogey says establish common moral ground by starting with less emotionally charged topics. Um, Sean is sharing a few resources regarding civic ed. So thank you very much for that, Sean. And then Shauna says, I like the idea of having a tabletop exercise with cases and scenarios and would like to implement this at our school. So folks, any other uh, takeaways? Love to hear them. Um, Luis says, today's session helped me realize and make me think in my role to solve situations with empathy. It's a great takeaway, I think. And Kathy says, I like the wording motive versus consequences. Allison says, today's session helped me realize I need to prioritize this in our school community. It makes me think this is more possible to achieve than sometimes I fear. After today's session, I plan to talk to my head of school about a whole school program or a course in civil discourse. Allison, hope that you will take a look at our resources and of course the Caring Schools Network, I think could go a long way toward helping you do that. Um, and then Giselle says, the link on Civic Ed says the page is not found. So we can help guide you uh, to the right space, Giselle. I think that you might've been referring to maybe Sean's post up above. Um, with that, I, you know, I think that, that looks like all the, uh, the takeaways so far, Rick. Um, be happy to kind of open up for general question and answer. We, we don't have a lot of time left, but would love to be able to answer any, any burning questions before we go ahead and close out. So if you have them, I think go ahead and just uh, unmute yourself and let us know. Also should mention that Luis says, after today's session, I plan to review some norms to avoid conflicts. So that's terrific. Any questions before we close out for the day? Kathy. Helene. Okay, okay, I'm not sure. All right. So, um, yeah, my question is, any advice on working with Sorry, parents? Kathy. <laughs> oh, that's okay. No worries. Um, any advice on working with parents um, when they're very involved and when the school is extremely divided and try, and try to bring them into the process? Um, just like today, there's a lot of stuff going on in social media, uh, discussions about certain teachers, um, trying to influence the curriculum. Um, so just thoughts on that. So um, I, think it's a, I think it's a terrific question and, and, a, and, a, and a very complicated issue. And I say this some, as someone who co-founded a school and I, I will tell you, and I'm sure many of you have had this experience that sometimes you bring up a political topic in school that uh, provokes a parent and you're under siege for some period of time dealing with the fallout of that. And, um, and I think that uh, some checking in with parents about these conversations is very important um, to see, uh, just to get a general sense of its, if whether they are comfortable with having these conversations, some framing of what these conversations are maybe the sharing of a scenario. Um, I also think that if you, I mean, it depends what kind of, you know, it depends what kind of school you are, but you might decide at a school that if parents are choosing to come to your school, that they understand that this is what part of what your school is going to do, that you're gonna get into difficult moral conversations that involve political difference. Um, in my experience, 
uh, people are really open. Parents tend to be open and think it's important to have these conversations, but they're worried about indoctrination. They're worried that um, it's, it's really a, a cover for indoctrination, that liberal teachers really want to indoctrinate or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so the extent to which parents can be reassured about that, I think is important as well. Thank you. There are no other questions. We're not seeing any in the chat. So we could go ahead and close out for the day. Well, thank you all. This has been a pleasure. And I really appreciate how thoughtful the comments and questions are. And I, I hope we be in, I hope we're all in touch. All right. Yeah, thanks very thank much. Thank you so much. It's great. Thanks. Just a reminder to everyone, um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can join our newsletter. Um, I posted earlier. Uh, about that, but we'll be sure to follow up with an email. You can also join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and again, we'll be sending an email with information about how to do that, as well as resources from this conversation. Um, the entire presentation will be online on our website, and so you can check it out there. Uh, we'll also be posting in the same space uh, a number of resources to help you both speak with families and uh, begin this work in your schools. So a huge thank you from MCC. Rick, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you a lot, and I work at MCC, so there we go. Um, hope that we see all of you next time. And once again, big, huge thanks from MCC. Have a great day.